this is Eric Schumacher, and I just did an interview with the Keith Andrew Network and had a total blast. I encourage anyone in the entertainment industry to participate and also for I encourage fans to uh, support this, uh, this show with a really great message. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching the Keith Andrew Network. It's episode 616. I'm here with a professional voiceover actor and actor, and his name is Eric Schumacher. I just want to say thank you for being a guest on my talk show. Well, thank you so much for having me, Keith. I appreciate it. No, the honor's all mine. For people who want to know what my talk show is about, the whole point of my talk show is to show people that even if I have an award in disability, I can stare my mouth to something, and at the same time, I'm able to turn myself into an example for people out there dealing with any types of learning disabilities and disabilities, and never give up and prove people wrong. Prove them, but labels do not dictate who you are and who you're going to be. You need to prove them and stare my mouth to something, so hashtag break the labels. That being said, free, uh, 33 minutes and counting is your uh, half hour, 33 minutes. Don't mind me, I have a lot on my mind. Half hour, 33 minutes, you can say anything you want, talk about anything you want, gloves off, I have nothing up my, off my sleeves. <laughs> and with that being said, it's a normal conversation. Remember, it's PG, PG-13, but you can say anything you want. But the first okay. thing I do want to start off for our listeners is make sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube page Keith Angie Network. Hit that like, subscribe button, so you're all up to date with all of the episodes. Make sure to follow me on Instagram, Keith Andrew Network, Twitter, Keith Andrew 88, and my Facebook fan page, KeithAngieNetwork.com. And don't worry, I will have your Instagram on the bottom, on the second part of the show, on the bottom of the screen, so people can follow you on Instagram. Sure but is. with that being said, and Let's have some fun with it, make it a little different, because we're talking about social media. I know. Social media, can it make you or break you with everything that you accomplish in your life? Does Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Stage 32, or even other, those other sites I didn't mention, does social media dictate if people should work with you and, or if you should get an acting role? That's a really excellent question. Um, I don't think I've gotten that question before. Um, you know, I think uh, the role of social media is has become increasingly more and more important. It, it can absolutely make or break a career, especially in entertainment. We've seen this happen a lot lately as, um, you know, certain uh, well-known folks have said things that have either been completely misperceived or very accurately perceived as offensive by one group or another, and uh, I've seen even some really decent, kind people say something that was misinterpreted, and they're driven off of social media, and then work becomes difficult for them to get. Um, and I've seen the opposite, of course, where you know some really <laughs> vile people have said vile things, and then the same things happen to them. Um, likewise, um, you know, it's to the point now in terms of as a performer, where in, in many cases during the casting process, someone will ask you, what's your social media like, if they don't already know that. So, um, you know, that social media, while it can also be faked, and I do not recommend doing that, it's, it's just a bad scene to try to, like, buy followers or things like that. Um, you know, there it is important to uh, maintain a social media profile or social media profiles that are consistent with your image and with the and with what you uh, mean to project to the world. What you want to what you want people to not only think of you, but what you want to give to the world. And it's also important that that profile is consistent when it comes to the casting standpoint. Um, it, it sort of identifies to a to casting people, what really is your brand? What's your persona? What, how do they? How should they look at you? And, and of course, the number of followers and the interactivity, most importantly, of those followers is extremely important um, because it's just a—it's a very quick window into. Does anybody care about what this artist is doing? 
um, which is, is particularly in today's um, multimedia world, um, you know, the, 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 the necessity of driving viewership is increasingly larger, especially online. It's funny as you mention that. It's like, does anyone really care? You can easily turn that around on me. Does anyone really care about disabilities? If they did, yeah. I would have a big following, but I'm really struggling with getting people. Well, <laughs> excuse me. Well, you know, I have that effect on people. Lot, there's a lot of there's a lot of competition for attention out there, and uh, it's that's the, that's the other thing. I mean, I've heard a number of people who are just starting out in social media say, you know, I'll get a social media profile, and because what I'm saying is valuable or interesting, it's going to explode and when you consider how much traffic there is on social media, there's both uh, an, an art and a science to gaining attention on social media, and uh, it can be extremely challenging, even if you have a great message. Um, you know, but I think it's important that you get your message out there, and um, the audience that it finds will be an audience that really needs or wants to hear it. And then study. It really just comes down to... Um, and, and I should add, you know, as you said in the beginning, I'm an actor, uh, but I'm also a producer and a director and uh, um, have some uh, uh, a fair amount of experience in entertainment marketing. And, uh, you know, so it's important also to just sort of study the ways of marketing, not as, as a negative thing, but as a, you know, how is it, what is the, what's the science behind ma helping your message to reach its intended audience so that the work can be done. Um, and then try lots of things, uh, and over time, hopefully that audience grows. But it's it, it is difficult. It's not just as you as you know yourself. It's not just as simple as get the message out there. But but there's a lot of a lot more to be done on a regular basis, and it's a lot of work. That's why there are companies that do social media full time. No, absolutely, and I'm very interested in those boards that you have behind you. You know, all. Clipper things. I was thinking about actually buying my own, but I see myself breaking them. Oh. <laughs> they break often, actually. <laughs> so you're not wrong about that. <laughs> I have. Uh, you might see behind me two of them. Uh, one of them is a newer one, and one of them is an older one. And the older one is held together with tape right now. <laughs> we actually we you know we go through uh, and and truly clapper boards are um, you know kind of slowly being replaced by electronic versions of them. But it's kind of a kind of a cool thing still to have on a set, despite that they can deafen you if, you, <laughs> if they're too close to your face. <laughs> that happened. An overzealous uh, uh, individual has uh, you know slapped them hard so that the uh, mic can definitely hear them, and I've had to kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, we wonder if you can show us some of that. What's the like? Show us the difference. Maybe our viewers will find that interesting. I know you have a well, black and white one, and you have a color one. So uh, sure. I, uh, uh, well, I can try to uh, grab them here. Hold on a sec. Um, let me uh, saunter over. I'll be right back. Yeah, like I said, anything can happen live. Okay. Like I said, anything can happen live. So you can get out, walk <laughs> around, sell us your place. Because apparently okay, so you do have a lot to show off. This is the this is the broken one that's kind of falling apart. This is kind of a legacy thing from our company, CLE Studios. It was used for quite a long time uh, on a bunch of projects, and uh, uh, so it's you know I took a bunch of tape off of it after we got it out of the studio recently. This is the newer one, and so the difference basically being, and this has a magnetic closure up here that holds it closed, so it's not flapping around in between. And you write things like, you know, there's a director who's, who's uh, which this one's for us for a camera. Um, the scene number roll is a little archaic since we don't really use film rolls anymore. But uh, um, and and so we replace a lot of this information. Sometimes cover it up with tape. And so basically, uh, you do you know the, do you know the point of these um, and why they're used? Yes, uh, to, so, to get you ready to do your part. Yeah, essentially what it is is it's uh, it's for syncing sound, uh, typically, and so uh, the camera rolls or cameras roll, and then there's uh, and I won't go into a lot of details because when there's multiple cameras, it's a little bit of a bigger process, and then audio rolls, which is recorded separately, and so uh, having this sound like that helps to give a singular point by which the sound can be synced up together because it's coming from a different source, 
in post-production. Um, now, these days I should add that another reason that these are becoming a little less needed, uh, two reasons really, uh, when you look at video files in a post when you were using film, um, there's usually a screenshot that can kind of give you a clue as to what scene it is, and of course there's also script supervisors taking notes on you know, which take it is and which file, and then someone running, uh, a DIT, the, uh, who's a digital technician, is running and uh, uh, backing everything up and, you know, storing, uh, creating files so that it's easier to reference. Um, and then there's also software that automatically syncs the sound and the video together, so there's a lot more, a lot less guesswork and very few adjustments that have to happen after that runs. But all that being said, this provides an easy source. So, for example, we might run the camera, and then someone will say, "Okay, camera's at speed," and then we'll run sound. Sound is at sound is at speed, and then someone will say, "Okay, we're doing uh, you know such and such production scene blank, uh, take two, and then they go like that. And that sound is such a pinpoint sound that it really makes that sound syncing process easy. Whether it's or easier, it's not you know whether it's being done largely electronically or whether for some reason someone's still doing that manually by actually taking the sound file and the video file and matching up their beginning point at this spike in audio because the camera will also have a a, uh, a microphone on it which is not used for uh, the final production it's just used to help match the sound for the video um, so now of course doing this wrong uh, brace yourself. I wouldn't say wrong necessarily, but you know, you just don't want to do this too close to an actor. It's really loud, right? And uh, especially if you've got a really quiet set, maybe a quiet scene, and you're, you know, you're really deeply focused in character. There've been a couple of times where you know, it's just a mistake, and somebody gets a little too close to me, just wham, slams that thing down, and I, I can't hear anything for the next who knows how long. And so when you're this close, you might just tap it. Uh, and then you, you do make sure that the camera picks it up. Anyway, I, I don't do this part professionally, so I'm probably poorly explaining it compared to the folks who are really in charge of these things, but that's kind of a general idea of how these things work. Yeah, maybe it's a good thing I don't have one, because I'd probably be sarcastic with it. <laughs> just randomly walk up behind someone and just clap it. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they can, they can be, they, they, uh, also if you, you know, uh, there have been occasions when for one reason or another I had to run, I had to run these, and I mean, it's not like they're complicated instruments, but this tells you, you know, how hyper-focused I am on my particular skills, but you know, this is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a, it's a useful thing, and, and these days, though, again, a lot of this is being done by um, um, uh, apps. In fact, on uh, on tablets, um, which can even be, uh, you know, which, which which create the sound and make it easier to type, to customize the uh, the message as to um, what the uh, shot is and you know the tape and all that stuff. So, no, absolutely. And what else? my haphazard explanation. Sorry to all my film colleagues if I wasn't quite uh, on target with that, but I'm on the spot here. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> 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 oh, that's what I'm trying to make my show a little different. Get up, walk around. I want it to be interactive. I'm not going to be like, all right, tell me about this now. Mm, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> I want it to be fun, spontaneous. So what else, if you're okay with it, what else do you have? Uh, what other goodies do you have? I see you have a uh, power wire hooked up. Uh, is that like a car charger or something? Oh, yeah. I've got, well, you know, this is this is my, my office. So I've got... Uh, uh, it's partially storage and partially, um, uh, you know, just functional office space. I do a ton of video calls in here with, uh, um, you know, film colleagues from all over the country, all over the world. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, standard stuff like various charging things. And, of course, uh, I'm, I am a uh, martial artist, so I yeah, have nice. a variety of uh, swords and other weapons in here, which uh, uh, typically, and so here's, a, here's something that no one who doesn't, Anyone who doesn't work with me uh, on the producing side typically doesn't know because they're not, uh, you know, in my space, so to speak. But uh, I tend to have some kind of a some kind of a martial arty thing just about everywhere. Um, it just I don't know. I guess it brings me a sense of comfort. Maybe it's a mental thing of kind of blending my my, my multiple worlds. Um, so uh, um, and and it, they actually come quite in handy because we've ended up using some of them as hero props for certain productions. <laughs> um, 
you have a, a show called uh, My Soul and Time Machine, which is in post-production, and uh, there's a character in that who uh, um, is a, uh, uh, a, a you know a warrior type character, and uh, uh, so we decided to use some of my, my personal uh, swords as their as their their weaponry. Um, yeah, it's really cool. And actually, you gave me a great idea uh, for a TV idea. But I won't say it on the air. I tell you all. Oh, yeah, don't say it on the air. <laughs> <laughs> but while we're on the subject, disabilities, have you ever worked with, apparently you're working with me because, you know, you are. But, um, but have you ever worked with people with disabilities? And are you willing to work with people with disabilities? Um. You know, yeah, I have, although, um, you know, I, I can't say that in the film context I've worked with more than just a couple folks with very visible physical disabilities, certainly um, with, um, you know, learning disabilities, mental illnesses, etc. I mean, uh, frankly... Hi, I'm Marissa Joy Davis. This is Michelle Wong. And I'm Nancy Rose. My name is Brandy Hunt. And Hello, my name is Raven Wynn. Hi there. My name is Giovanna Vidal. Hi, I'm Monica Thomas. Hi, I'm Paisley Blackburn. I'm Ashley Burgess. Hi, my name is Jeanette Abney. Hi, I'm Sharon Spank. Hey, this is Samantha Moore. Hi, I'm Melody Jones. Hi, my name is Becky Yee. Hi, you're watching the Keith Andrew Network. Gentlemen, we just had a little Skype uh, fart fair, so we're whooping. We can use that for a commercial break. So we're back with Eric Zumacher. Now, it's the last 17 minutes. We were talking about social media. You gave us a tour of your place. And we talked about disabilities. And so the last oh, question yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask you is, how many years have you been an actor, and who influenced you to become an actor? Well, um, I'd rather not say how many years, because that'll tell you my age. But uh, let's just say for uh, um, uh, at, at, at least a college student's work, <laughs> maybe two. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I have been an actor for most of my life. My... Uh, uh, my parents are both actors, and uh, they raised me as that. Um, you know, they were starving actors uh, in the San Francisco area and then in the Los Angeles area, and um, <clears throat> so they just shared their their passion for the art with me. And uh, over the years, I fell in love with uh, the process of acting, with the uh, with the literature. Um, <clears throat> I've told this story before. My my dad and I, when we lived in in the Los Angeles area, when I was a little kid used to go out to um, Roxbury Park and uh, we would bring plastic swords with us and we would, we would, he would teach me stage fencing while we recited parts of Hamlet. And, uh, and that, those were really special times and uh, he would tell me about his exploits in the theater, on TV and whatnot and I uh, just, I wanted to do that and I never gave up on that. So I've been... Uh, pursuing it ever since, and then eventually um, uh, I realized that I should know more about what happened behind the scenes, so I started studying the filmmaking aspect and realized I had an aptitude there as well, and so I um, uh, started to pursue that also, and uh, so now I do both uh, almost interchangeably, sometimes at the same time. <laughs> no, absolutely. Now, what, what influenced you to become an actor? No, not an actor, I'm sorry. What influenced you to become a director and a producer? Well, it was a series of events, really. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, I had the germ of the idea, uh, and I actually wrote about this a little bit in an article. I'm, uh, I'm also a columnist for uh, Flapper Press, which is a, um, an online magazine um, that was started by Elizabeth Grayson, who's a former Miss America, and also... Uh, one of the stars of the Highlander TV series, uh, you might remember as Amanda on that show. And uh, I, I went to a Star Trek convention. And I was maybe 12 or something. Yes, right? <laughs> and I saw uh, uh, Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura on the original Star Trek, was there, and she spoke. And she talked about uh, an experience she had that I'll badly paraphrase, where she was offered a Broadway show, and she was originally a Broadway performer, and she really wanted to take that and so she it was about I think it was about the third season of Star Trek and so she was she had announced that she was leaving Star Trek. And she got a phone call, this was the nineteen sixties, from Martin Luther King Junior, uh, which is awesome. And uh, apparently Martin Luther King Junior was a fan of Star Trek and he 
to paraphrase the way that I remember her saying it um, uh, and get as close to it as I can, she, she said, Michelle, I hear you're leaving Star Trek, and I want to point out to you that there are a bunch of little black girls and little black boys and little white girls and little white boys who see the equivalent of a female naval officer uh, on television every week and think about that and the effect that it's having. So she stayed on the show. And when she said that, it occurred to me uh, the social power that um, the media, that multimedia could have and that maybe I could sort of, I, I could do something like that. I could have an effect. And then over time, just, you know, watching uh, media, I wasn't quite sure how I was going to apply that because my goal was really to be an actor. But I just kept thinking, you know, I, I could produce things somehow and, uh, and maybe do something good with it. And uh, kind of the next big, you know, transition in that was I didn't really know how I was going to get there. And I saw um, a, 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 friend, a, a film called Hollywood Shuffle by the legendary Robert Townsend. And then, and it was a funny, funny, funny film, a big spoof on Hollywood, and particularly the African American experience in Hollywood. And, um, and then I found out that he produced the whole thing on his credit cards, and he'd taken a huge risk, and you know, done a lot of guerrilla filming, and it was a hit. And that occurred to me. Well, wait a minute, maybe this is more accessible than I think it is. And so when I I went to a community college. Uh, you know, to continue some of my dramatic studies, it was a fairly well-known program there, um, and uh, it was at the College of Marin, in fact, um, which uh, one of the places Robin Williams studies studied among others. And um, I decided to start studying the filmmaking side there as well, and got a really good exposure to that. And then I started to get work in the filmmaking side before I graduated, and. Uh, um, so I realized again that I had the aptitude and people were starting to hire me to do things. And, um, and so then I began to start producing and, uh, what's kind of cool is that when you produce, um, which is generally considered to be a wise thing for an actor to do anyway, if they can, um, in fact, almost expected at this point, because it's <laughs> quotes easier to produce media than it ever has been. Not that it's easy. And, uh, you know, but if I'm putting a film together, for example, and I'm in a casting process and I'm right for a role, well, that's, an, that's an easy casting process for me <laughs> because I can, I can cast myself. I'm the producer. Um, you know, mind you, I'm, I'm pretty uh, uh, adamant that I only put myself in roles that are right for me. But uh, that being said, um, you know, it's, it's been really quite an enlightening experience to uh, work both sides because I now have a really in-depth understanding of how the filmmaking world works, both technically and in terms of the strategy and the planning and the marketing and the distribution and all that. And um, I think it just may, it makes it easier for me to be a good actor, frankly, because I, you know, before I understood all this stuff, for example, I had no idea what, uh, you know, what how the sound department worked or the camera department worked or the lighting or makeup or any of that. And now that I do, I can, I'm kind of a better partner to all of those people. I have a greater understanding of what they need me to do before they say it, and a lot more compassion for the insane amount of work they also go through. No, I agree with you, and that brings up to our last subject I want to talk to you about. It's SAG Extra. Do you have to be a part of SAGs to get a TV role, to get an acting role, to get on TV? And because one person said to me, yeah, um, well, we have this great script we're working on. Problem is, I can't have you part of it. It's because you're not a SAG extra. And there's other people. And my friend, um, well, my co-worker anyway, um, said she had to pay about almost $3,000 and up to be SAG extra. And I don't want to piss away $3,000 if it's not going to guarantee you work. And being an actor doesn't guarantee you work. It isn't a Monday to Friday job. You have to act for it. You have to audition for it. You look at Hugh Jackman. You look at Russell Crowe. You look at Charlie Scenes. You look at George Collin, Rowan Williams, um, Patrick Swayze, um, yourself, myself. You have to audition for that. So it isn't a guarantee. It's not like, okay, uh, when can you start? And here's just how much you're going to get paid. It would be nice if it was a Monday for Friday job. 
Uh, and it's a, for an example... It might be on a television series. <laughs> yeah. So, well, <laughs> this, well, in general, say, hey, we're going to do a series. Uh, you got to have a free-year contract, and after that, you're on your own. But for the free years, you're going to be taken care of. Not say, okay. do your acting part. All right, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Because I do want to become an actor. I would, I do want to get myself into the entertainment entertainment business. Problem is, I don't feel comfortable pissing away three thousand or more money on a gamble. If that was the case, I would have went to college. <laughs> but um, for the reason I did the show, it's to show you, hey, look at what someone who reads and learns at a fifth grade level. Who's learned, see, reads and learns at a fifth grade level, who's on the same level as a middle school or a high school person, uh, can't go to college, who's on the spectrum of being retarded. Look at, I created this to show you, look at what I'm able to accomplish. And no money is being involved in this, but this is my way of shoving my foot through the door. I'm using this as a door stopper. Say like, well, you may say I don't have a BA or bachelor's, but look at what I have accomplished so far. Six and a half years, um, over 616 interviews, thanks to you. Um, I have interviewed actors, actresses, models, CEOs, professional wrestlers, people with disabilities, people without disabilities, and I didn't get any of those special um, BAs, or BSs, or whatever degrees you want to call. Uh, I didn't go to those fancy schools like Harvard, or Yale, or Warden. Look at what I'm capable of doing for someone who's supposed to be on the spectrum and say, you're a burden, you're going to be in a group home, and you're never going to mount to something. So for me, this is my way of getting my high school college degree and saying I am good enough to do the same exact thing you can do only yes it's got to be scaled back but look at what I'm capable of accomplishing and what's that being said oh, go ahead I'm sorry I think, I think it's a fantastic uh, attitude and approach to life you know and uh, it, it actually in the entertainment industry kind of to your point which you know you get a lot of people telling you it's impossible, you can't do it, no. And certainly when you're dealing with any sort of disability or really, I mean, just about everyone gets that. It's just to the to different degrees depending upon their circumstances and how other people perceive them. And uh, I think that uh, while you've got to be aware of what you have to work with, um, you also can't just take no for an answer as you know when people tell you you're not going to amount to anything that's i think that's a challenge i don't think that's a i don't think that's a, a pronouncement although the other person may think it is i think it's better to look at it as okay challenge accepted and uh, certainly i've had a lot of battles myself a lot of things to fight through i've had plenty of no's and plenty of you can't possibly make it in various aspects of life including the entertainment industry and and, uh, you know, it, that, you're always going to get that no matter how far you come. Um, I think, uh, you know, to your question about the, um, the joining SAG-AFTRA and getting into films, well, first off, you, you, you don't just join. There's, you actually have to um, be in a certain uh, number of productions at a certain level in order to be accepted. Um, so typically the process is, uh, however, there's, uh, and forgive me, the rules aren't fresh in my head, but uh, there's limitations typically as to how many um, uh, people can be uh, brought on who are not part of the Screen Actors Guild. In a Screen Actors Guild level project, um, you know, uh, without penalties of, of one sort or another. And again, there's a lot of rules, so I'm... You know, I gotta look at the look at the books to give you more correct answers. But as a general principle, um, if you're going to be in a Screen Actors Guild level project above what's known as an ultra low budget film, for example, which is two hundred fifty thousand dollars budget and under, anything above that, um, then if you're 
if you are cast in it, they give you what's known as a Taft-Hartley agreement, and that basically says, okay, you can work in this, in this union project even though you're not union, but if you – and it's different rules for different levels, like if you're an extra versus a uh, speaking performer um, – you know, then, uh, then you, then if you get do another one of these within a certain period of time, um, you have to actually join the union, um, and that's where you pay your, you know, your thousands of dollars. Um, now there are different levels of productions. Uh, so there, there are productions that are screen actors guild level, and those are typically things like, uh, uh, well, I mean, actually, it can be any number of different kinds of productions. Um, but uh, most certainly those are going to be network television shows. Most certainly those are going to be larger release films and many smaller release films um, and really anything in between. But in order for a project to be considered a Screen Actors Guild production, the producers have to sign an agreement with the Screen Actors Guild, which is so that they can work with actors who are part of the Screen Actors Guild. There's also a large field of actors who are not part of the Screen Actors Guild, and they cannot work on Screen Actors Guild projects without that Taft-Hartley agreement and only a certain number of them before they must join. Um, so it's, it's, it's far more complicated than that, unfortunately. Um, I wish it weren't because it's, it, you know, it's just it's hard to understand all of it. Um, but the short story is that if, uh, if you were cast in a production that was a Screen Actors Guild production, you know, lots of other rules that have to be considered, but in theory it is possible certainly to perform in it um, without joining once. <laughs> and as an extra, I think there's, I think you have to do it. Um, I think it's two or three times or something before you have to join. But again, look up the rules and there, there are on the screen actors Guild website. There are some attempts to explain it and they do make it much clearer than the contracts do. Um, and, and that might help. And, uh, I think you can also call the, the guild and, and talk to someone directly who might be able to give you more intro. But it doesn't guarantee you work. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Now, as you were saying, you know, um, we're going back to the thing real fast. Now I'll yeah. pass it over to you. It's just because you pay thousands, thousands, thousands of dollars. I feel like it's, in a way, a big waste. I'm probably shooting myself in the foot, but I'm going to be completely honest. I feel like it's a big waste and it's a gamble because I'm going to pay thousands of thousands of thousands of dollars. Congrats, you're part of SAGs, but you're not good enough. You're not a good actor. And you're just like, well, I paid all this money and I'm not getting acting roles. Well, the truth of the matter is that, um, you know, this field is incredibly difficult. The competition is unbelievable. I mean, uh, there are thousands upon thousands of yeah. actors who don't work. Uh, both both SAG members and non-SAG members, and that's just the nature of the game. There are there are more projects, there are less projects for each type than there are actors for that type by many, 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 many. Um, so yeah, it is a big it is a big gamble, and, it's, and you could say that it's much the same with filmmaking in general. Highly competitive field, and now we're even at a point where. You know, anyone with a cell phone uh, can theoretically make a piece of media and put it out there. And even if it's not of great quality and even if it's not something that people really want to watch, it's clutter that makes it harder for people to find the, the higher quality stuff. And some of it is really good, on a, you know, occasionally. So it's uh, in the acting field, you know, you've got to consider that, that this is a business and uh, uh, there are people whose job is to find the right performers for the right roles and there's usually less of them than really should there really should be to get through the mass of people who send in auditions so every time an actor auditions for something there may be you know thousands of people auditioning for that same role and the odds of actually getting in are unbelievably low i think what it comes down to is this you know as it is with any difficult field um are you how what's your passion level you know um i've said this a number of times in interviews and and it's so relevant that i say it actually in almost every interview because this subject comes up one of my great mentors uh paul Manti, who uh was a a, 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 you know, a well-known-ish actor he uh was a regular on the cagney and lacy television series in the 80s and he uh, was a star of a 1960s uh, sci-fi film called robinson crusoe on mars and had a bunch of other really great character roles and a bunch of stuff uh, and he was one of the people until he passed away uh, a few years ago who was 
kind of gave me a lot of mentoring. And he, the mo- uh, probably one of the most profound things he ever said to me was, um, you know, because I had my high hopes about my acting career. And he said, Eric, if there's anything you could possibly think of that you would want to do with your life that would make you feel fulfilled other than being in the entertainment industry, please go do that. This is really hard. It's, it's really difficult to make it as close to impossible. But if you can't possibly think of anything else that would make you feel fulfilled, then okay, go do this, but understand you're going to make a lot of sacrifices. It's not going to be easy, and there's no guarantee of success. And uh, so I did that deep introspection, even you know, took sort of a semi-break from the performing world as I dug deep into my martial arts studies for a while. And that, that process of you know, doing an occasional acting gig here and there, but I wasn't really all in at that time. And that process of going through that personal development and personal questioning, uh, which was also core to my martial arts experience, led me back to this and led me back to acting, led me back to filmmaking. And I realized this is what I'm supposed to do and I have to do it and I've got to get it, give it everything. Um, I tell, I, I frequently uh, am a mentor uh, younger filmmakers and younger actors here and there. Um, and, uh, and in fact, I get a group of high school students pretty much every year. A friend of mine is a high school drama teacher. And when one of his students says they want to get into film, he sends them to me <laughs> and, uh, and we go through a formal mentorship process. And every time I meet with them, and this will take the surprise away from any of them who might be watching, cause I think I have a new group coming. Um, <clears throat> I tell them, okay, first meeting. I'm going to do everything in my power to frighten you away from being in the entertainment industry. I'm going to try to scare the living crap out of you as to what this is about and how this is going to work. And if I cannot successfully do that, you might just make it. And I think that that's a compassionate thing to do. I tell them all the, all the hard side, all the dark side, all the scary side. There's a lot of great things about it. There's a lot of wonderful things, man. There's nothing like I, you know, I'm thinking back to a somewhat recent moment. I'm standing on set at old old Tucson Studios, where over 200 major westerns were made. I mean, Paul Newman and John Wayne walked these hallowed grounds in the same place where I'm walking, and I'm in a costume as Doc Holliday. I've got a world famous director in front of me, multiple high de- multiple 4K cameras pointed at me, and this is a glorious moment. You know, I'm doing the gunfight at the freaking OK Corral as Doc Holliday. I've studied the script. I've worked hard. I've become this character. That's what it's all about. Those moments tend to come few and far between. And uh, for someone who is essentially born to this, born for this, then you just keep going so you can have more of those moments. And you just keep going because what's important to you, I mean, of course, it's different for everyone. But for me, it ultimately comes down to that I want to recreate the experience I had as a kid when during my training as an actor, my dad took me to this theater in LA that specialized in doing classic movies. And I remember coming out of the theater, having watched a Gene Kelly movie or an Errol Flynn movie or a Humphrey Bogart movie. And, you know, having, having had this experience, like I remember coming out of the movie Captain Blood with Errol Flynn and Basil Rathbone and, you know, about, uh, about a, a crew of slaves uh, who take over the ship and become pirates and then do good. <laughs> and uh, um, and I came out of that theater feeling like I could do anything, feeling like I was on top of the world. I was trying to fence everyone in the audience, everyone who was coming out of the theater. And I, I want to be able to give that experience and share that experience with audiences and other experiences of sorrow, of pain, of compassion, of understanding. And that is so important to me that I'm willing to go through the extraordinarily difficult work that it takes to run an entertainment career. And that's not the path for everyone. And I think it's important that if someone has those dreams, they explore them, they test them out. And when you get to that point where it's like, oh, God, this is hard, then you're tested. Then you then you can make that determination of, do I really want this? Do I really want this? Or was it something that was just something for me to pursue so that I could understand something about myself and then take my next path, which is entirely valid as well. No, absolutely. Now I do have a couple questions for you off the air. A box of Chewies behind you really uh, caught one of my questions for you. But apparently it's for your dog. You don't eat them. (laughs) No, I do not, uh, at least that I'll ever admit. 
<laughs> no, that's uh, that's just yeah. They just ship dog food, and I uh, repurpose the box for something as we move papers and supplies around. And you know, you run out of you run out of the out of the nice looking plastic boxes, and you go, ah, this is free. Put it in there. <laughs> that's a nice box. I want to talk to you about it off the air, uh, but wrapping up. How can people follow you? And I know that's a bad joke. I do apologize. But I try to have fun with everyone. Uh, how can people follow you on social media? Are you on Twitter, Instagram? I'm darn near everywhere. Um, predominantly, I have a, I'm have on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, those are kind of my uh, my primary places that I pay attention to. You can also find me on IMDb. You can find me at uh, ericschumacherfilm.com. And you can also find my production company, which is in the process of rebooting our website as well as our entire um, – uh, uh, we're, we're making a bunch of new productions, and we're also in the process of working on a new business plan. But uh, sealystudios.com, that's S-E-E-L-I-E, and the word studios, plural, dot com. I got a lot of great stuff coming out soon through that uh, organization. You should definitely have an Instagram page. You follow me, I'll follow you. I do have an Instagram page. I will, I will make sure to follow you and look forward to seeing what you post there. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, if I add, by the way, also uh, very currently, <clears throat> um, we have uh, – there are two films that uh, we've uh, worked on recently that are currently going through film festivals. Uh, one of them is a short uh, uh, produced by Rick Mel Productions, uh, which my company – uh, assisted with called uh, Bequests, and it's uh, won, uh, I think it's six film festival awards so far, and screening next in Las Vegas, and uh, <clears throat> at the Silver State Film Festival. And uh, Revenge of Zoe, which is a geek culture comedy feature um, by Pondo Enterprises and Desert Isle Productions and Sealy Studios, and uh, <clears throat> that just screened at the Gen Con convention in Indianapolis, and is uh, slated next up uh, for the uh, um, uh, um, for the Newark, New Jersey Film Festival, uh, in, in, in Newark International Film Festival. So excited about those two projects finally getting in front of audiences. No, oh, absolutely. Hey, if you're ever in the New York area, let's we'll definitely work together. Happy to. And my last we, we do a live in-person interview. Yeah, that'd be nice. Now, like I said, I do have a couple questions for you off the air. But when I first approached you to be a guest in my talk show, what was your first reaction what made you say yes, and how do you feel now, and what do you recommend it? Well, my first reaction was, uh, you know, and I, uh, you sent me the LinkedIn invite, and I uh, read up on you a little bit, so my first reaction was, yeah, I certainly want to be a part of this. I mean, you're, you're trying to do something good, and, uh, um, and I appreciate your tenacity. I, 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 I respect tenacity since I've got tons of it myself. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so it was really that, just, you know, yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. Um, and, uh, uh, and in terms of advice, uh, is there something specific you're looking for? Like, uh, um, uh, you know, like, well, um, actually, what was your first uh, reaction? Uh, what made you say yes? And what do you recommend it to other people? Yeah, I certainly recommend it to other people. I and mean, again, I think you're doing something good here and you're trying hard to, uh, uh demonstrate, um, you know, what can be done through force of will and, uh, and good organization and, uh, so I'd certainly encourage others to to, uh, to 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 interview with you and and be a part of the show, um, and uh, and so yeah, I've had a, I've had a great time. We've had a really kooky, fun conversation. Very different interviews than than I'm used to, which I like a lot. Um, you know, it's uh, um, I, I kind of like going outside the box, which you do, and uh, yet you know, there's still enough of the formal questions. So I've had, had fun with this. No, absolutely. Now I do have a couple questions for you off the air. But wrapping up, it was a real honor in public having you as a guest. And I'm looking forward to part two down the road. Thanks, sir. Likewise.